Um, everybody, thank you so much for joining today. My name is Laura Furness. Um, I'm Head of Engagement at the Royal Society of Public Health, and I'm going to chair today. So welcome to our RSPH Sparks Debate Programme. Uh, the Royal Society of Public Health, for those of you who don't know, is an independent public health charity which is dedicated to improving and protecting people's health. We are a registered charity and an independent Royal Society incorporated by Royal Charter with the Queen as our patron. And we work to improve health through membership, convening, uh, policy programmes and training. And we've been running some webinars to give us the chance to discuss those issues that matter to, to members of the public and yourselves as both members of the public and as professionals. And so far we've covered issues around public health in the state, co-production, public health systems, and what we actually mean by public health. So all our sessions are recorded. They are available on our website. And if you are an RSPH member, uh, you can earn a CPD point for attending. Just log into the members area following the events and go to the webinar page um, and you can... So today we're going to hear from two um, very eminent uh, members of the professional body on geopolitical determinants of health. And most of us are probably familiar with the concept of social determinants of health. So our level of education, working conditions, job security, et cetera. But we're probably less familiar with the concept of geopolitical determinants of health, um, which are how our health and well-being is impacted by continental geographies, interests of countries, globalization, corruption, international aid, conflict, nationalism and disasters, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and Mental health is no exception. So mental Ill, Ill health uh, accounts for around about 13% of the world's total disease burden and around 10% of, of people at any one time. And it costs the equivalent of two and a half US dollars, two and a half trillion US dollars per year. Um, and we feel that consequences of uh, disasters on mental health are often underestimated by policymakers. And that includes things like the pandemic that we're all currently experiencing. So I think, the key elements um, are that you know foreign policy and international aid are really really crucial in the debate, and geopolitical determinants of health are related to countries' policies and their decisions. Significant clarity in how assistance is reached in developing countries. So, for example, um, development assistance for mental health increased more than three times over a six-year period, but it's in the um, from 2007 but it still only represents about 0.7 percent of the total development assistance for health so it's really minor around mental health uh, so this webinar today intends to provide a conceptual framework for understanding geopolitical determinants of health and uses a broader understanding of putting mental health into foreign and national policies yes. so mental health at the top of the well-being agenda and we've got two um incredible colleagues to come and speak to us today so Firstly, you're going to hear from Dr. Albert Pessord, who was one of the founders of the National Institute for Mental Health in England, which was established following the National Service Framework for Mental Health to support the implementation <laughs> of evidence-based practice. Um, Albert is a lifelong campaigner in equality and health and a proponent of cultural psychiatry. He co-founded the charity CARIF, which is the Centre for Applied Research and Evaluation International Foundation which is based at the Centre for Psychiatry Queen's Mar Queen Mary's School of Medicine and Dentistry and was awarded honorary life membership as a fellow by the General Assembly of the World Psychiatric Association in 2017. Uh, and he recently received several awards for service to the World Association of Cultural Psychiatry and contributions to cultural psychiatry in 2018. And then after Albert, we're going to hear from Professor Dinesh Bugra, CBE, who is a, I can never say this word, emeritus professor, I've got that wrong, um, of mental health and cultural diversity at the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience at King's College London. He is a past president of the Royal College of Psychiatrists, a past president of the World Psychiatric Association for a three year term, and is president of the British Medical Association from 2018 to 2019. He's authored um, or edited over 30 books including the prestigious Oxford textbook of public mental health, which won the Book of the Year award in 2019. So I'm very, very, very confident to say that we have people who are incredibly knowledgeable about this subject. Um, and on that note, I'm going to hand over to Albert uh, to start the discussion. Thank you very much. Just let me load my slides up. 
Okay, thank you. Can you see that? Yes. Yes. Okay. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. And thank you, Royal Society of Public Health, for facilitating and organizing this uh, event that we're having today. Today, the day before the end of the COP26 conference that is due to end in Glasgow. I want to start off my presentation by saying, I'm trying to move this. It is not an exaggeration to say that the world is facing a number of crises at a geopolitical level, many of which are transnational. Displacement, conflict, climate change, human rights violations, COVID poverty are all changing the cultural architecture of communities and the mental health footprints of individuals. The world is changing rapidly. In 2016, there were about six to 5.3 million people who were displaced from their homes and their country of origins. Many displaced within their country and many more displaced across the border. That 63.5 million people represent the size of possibly the United Kingdom and France. That was in 2016. However, today there is about 82.4 million people who are displaced in the world today. And that's the size of, budget of Germany. The numbers are increasing and that's a large increase in these few years. It is predicted in the next five years, that number will reach about 100 million. There, there was an additional 5 million people from Venezuela who were displaced because of the conflict in that region. And today, as I speak and you attend this event, there's over two and a half million Afghans who have become displaced from the current conflict. Of all the displaced people, about 7% are, are, are hosted in the high income countries, Europe, America, and places like that. 73% are in neighboring countries and 86% are hosted in the developing countries. So it's a myth to believe that displaced people or immigrants or refugees are all hosted or congregated in the rich countries. As we stand today, the majority of people displaced in Afghanistan are crossing the border into Pakistan and into Iran. Amongst the chaos of displacement, we do have 40.3 million people who are enslaved worldwide, and that's across the global south and the global north. Women and girls make up 71% of those, and one in four of those in modern slavery is a child working in the mines and, and working across the, 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 the sector of, of abuse. A third of the world population is now exposed to climatic conditions. People from low and middle income countries are feeling the brunt of it. 80% of the world poor will be affected by climate crisis. And these are the communities less able to mitigate against the disaster. We hear a lot about $100 million being offered to help these countries. The developing countries, the low and middle income countries, represent less than 4% of the total global emission. In Africa, it's even less. Where, where, where climate change is concerned, one of the biggest issues is flooding. And we've seen that in Bangladesh. But there's about 33 countries in the world. Solomon Islands, as an example, Trinidad as an example, or even Guyana in Latin America. These countries before climate change exist below the sea level. So any changes in, 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 in the temperature that, that give rise to uh, increased water level, that seawater then floods the land that displaces people and affects the agricultural uh, ability to grow, to grow stuff to, to feed their communities. To speak a bit about the pandemic, 97 million more people have been added to the poor list in 2020. More and more people from the low income countries are expected to increase po by poverty. More and more people affected by poverty and low income countries will move and become this number of displaced people. The World Bank estimates that COVID will add as many as 150 more extreme poor people by the end of 2021. Now, many of the new poor, eight out of 10 of the new poor will come from middle income countries. 
And I have to say, even in the global north, in high income countries, we're now seeing an increase in poverty, particularly in places like Europe, where, for example, gas prices have seen a fivefold increase. And many people are struggling to heat their places and, and pay the gas bill. They will not come into the category of extreme poverty, but nevertheless, they are poor or becoming poor. COVID has been with us for a couple of years now. And at the G7 uh, meeting in Cornwall, billions of vaccines were committed, but to date, only millions have del been delivered. High income countries have vaccinated 71% of the, their population, upper middle income countries, six to five. But the key figure there is a low income country. I've checked today, that figure is just about 4% of the low income country that has had the vaccination. Now, a, a, a former prime minister of the United Kingdom, Gordon Brown said recently, that there's a currently a hundred million COVID vaccine that is sitting in the Western world that is likely to expire at the end of this year. Why can't we not get that to the low income countries so they can get their people vaccinated? To add it to this dilemma, just under two and a half thousand billionaires have seen their collective fortune grow by four trillion during the pandemic. The cost of vaccinating the world is estimated at 141.2 billion. That's the entire world given getting two doses. That is less than 0.1% of the total global wealth in the world we have today, which stands at $400 trillion. This is a very small percentage that we require to vaccinate the world. Where population is concerned, Africa is the only region in the world that is projected to have strong growth in the next 25 to 40 years. By the end of the century, the Caribbean and Latin America will have the largest group of uh, over 65 people living there, which is a total reversal in trend uh, that we had at the end of we have at the end of the 20th century. My point in reciting this is to set the seed in relation to the geopolitics that's happening around the world and to set it in the context that when we are addressing mental health, we need to look at the geopolitical challenges that we are faced with arising out of these challenges we have. In response to these challenges, because it's very easy to put things up on slides and write papers and says, oh, look, there's a problem. But we, myself, Professor Dennis Berger and others have come up with an index that we call the Cape Vulnerability Index, Compassion, Assertive Action, Pragmatism and Evidence. Basically, it's a foreign policy tool that should be used to fund the, the countries most in need. We've identified the countries to, 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 to allocate the funding. We've used the parameters of life expectancy, DALIs, GINIs, Refugees, Corruption Perception Index, and have concluded, we've published this paper, and the second edition will be published next year. But what we've basically done is looked at all these global indices, cross-reference and rank of variety of health, socioeconomic, and eight indicators and the poorest 10% of the countries. We, this index offers a different perspective to rebalance and challenge the prevailing narrative of how foreign aid is utilized. And it helps us understand the world each, and each piece is a part of the jigsaw that we can put into place to tackle the problems we have faced. If you can see the slide clearly, I doubt it, but what I'm trying to highlight here We've identified 25 countries in the world. There's, there's about 200 countries in the world. We've identified 25 countries in the world that we've called fragile states. The old fashioned word were failed states. But these are fragile states. Fragile states, the Central African Republic, Somalia, Sudan, Afghanistan, Nigeria. As I said, our second edition will be published next year. But there's two countries that's entered this, this group of, of fragile states, and that's Yemen and uh, Venezuela. Now, these are the countries we should prioritize. Now, when we, I speak to the World Bank and colleagues at Gavi, I was surprised to see that these institutions have different lists of countries they use. So we we're offering this as a list of countries where we've combined climate change, COVID, corruption, uh, and, uh, and all the indices we have used to say this is the most up-to-date list. Let me present this in a different way. 
this is what the list looks like. These are 79 countries we've identified that has a level of fragility. Those in red are the fragile countries. And you can see that runs across the center of Africa that, once, that was once the bed basket of Africa. It's interesting to note that 71 countries in the world, 42 of them in Africa, are currently not on track to have given the first dose, the 40, first dose of the COVID vaccine to 40% of the population by the end of this year. And those are the fragile states. So it's not a case of just giving the vaccine, you require the infrastructure, you need the people to do it. But this list here, here shows that if we want to really focus on global health, we want to focus on global mental health and take a geopolitical approach, we need to, 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 to look at the countries most in need and work with those countries. Our Ked Van Billion Next offers an evidence structured and reasoned approach to using aid as a mental health as a foundation. We suggest that the same list should be used to allocate the vaccines. Overseas development aid reached $127.5 billion. There was a lot of money about. There are four major donors, USA, UK, Japan, and Germany. Global health spend is expected to be 140 billion by 2030. The UN target for 0.7% uh, and the UK have just re reduced it to 0.5%. There's only about seven countries that reached that target. But if every country had produced the 0.7 target, we'd have had an extra 107 billion pounds. The point I'm trying to make, there's a lot of promises, but very little delivery, as we will see again with the COP conference, an awful lot of promises. I really want to end my presentation here other than and to say to pay tribute to, to Julio Tulares and, and Jao Mir in Brazil and, and Paraguay respectively, who's working on a second edition and who I know is linked in and Dr. Anna Sear, who's helped us with this work, Garen Day and others. I'm gonna leave it there and come back to questions, but I'm gonna hand over now to Professor Dennis Brooker, who will take you through. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Albert. Um, please do put questions in the chat or in the Q&A box, um, as said, and, and we'll, we'll pick up as many questions as we can at the end. We've forwarded the questions that you've asked as you booked tickets as well. But yeah, delighted to hand over to uh, Dinesh next. Thank you very much. Thanks, Albert, for um, highlighting some of the issues. What I'm going to do, although I've got um, loads of slides, I may be whizzing through some of them. And if people want copies of the slide, just email me. I'd be very happy to share them. I think one of the big issues that I need to cover in the next 20, 25 minutes or so is to look at uh, the impact of geopolitical determinants on uh, mental health and mental illnesses. And I want to start off by saying that uh, there is a distinction. Quite often we get confused. I mean, particularly in this country, we talk about mental health issues, mental health, somebody suffering from mental health. I mean, surely that's a good thing if they're suffering. That's not suffering, that being that um, uh, they have successful performance of uh, mental function, productive activities, fulfilling relationships. And big challenge really is whether mental health and mental illnesses, are they on a spectrum? Can they exist separately or are they part of each other? And that's something that, you uh, know, I, I don't want to sort of get into this debate here, but perhaps at um, some point in the future, we can come back to that too identify because it's not a, there's not a single mental illness. There are mental illnesses of all ranges, shapes, sizes, severity, and they have different impact in different cultures. And similarly, different cultures have different ways of defining well-being and defining what's deviant, what's abnormal. And I think we just need to bear that in mind. So mental illnesses are a collectively reflect diagnosis of mental disorders, which are health conditions, which affect our thinking, mood, and behavior. And one of the big challenges really is looking at cross-cultural psychiatry is that um, different cultures and societies see abnormal behavior in very different ways. And that highlights uh, the challenge for clinicians. I mean, for example, you know, there's some fairly clear organic mental illnesses like Alzheimer's, uh, which causes alterations in thinking, especially forgetting, uh, whereas depression, 
my bipolar disorders are marked by alterations in mood. And then ADHD and hyperactivity disorder, um, these are largely marked by alterations in behavior. So we know, and you know, uh, paying tribute to Michael Marmot and his work through the WHO Commission on Social Determinants, it, they affect everyone in the society. And one of the challenges that the commission put forward was that social determinants need conceptualization, they need commitment and they need competency. And in order to reduce health inequalities, uh, we needed um, efforts across all social gradients. So this new discipline of geopsychiatry focuses on influences and impact of global factors such as globalization, foreign policy, climate change, public health crisis and disasters, uh, migration and other factors. And you know we've already heard from Albert about the figures which are really astounding. So geopolitical factors affect humankind in very different ways. Um, from direct impact of disasters, their consequences to indirect impact on countries and people who are not directly affected, but impacted in other ways. So losing your friends and family, people who migrate, you're left behind. What do you do? How do you deal with it? And particularly, um, we certainly saw a lot of it in Ebola epidemic and uh, SARS-1 was survivor guilt that people who survived, who lost members of their family, uh, who were infected but survived and the guilt that they have to deal with. Uh, so I'm just going to sort of highlight some of the stuff that Albert has already talked about, but just to remind us the conflict uh, that is still going on. 15 countries carry the burden, uh, Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan, their neighbors, South Sudan, Somalia, and you know the migration which occurs towards uh, Europe, and the number of deaths. I mean, they didn't, this is quite an old figure. About six years ago, there were over 5,000 migrant deaths in the moving from one country to another. And I'm pretty sure that that's a gross underestimate. And over the six years, that would have changed even more. So there have been a series of issues which have affected migrant flow from conflicts, Arab Spring, natural disasters in Nepal, Haiti, earthquake, public health, Ebola in um, Africa, Zika in Brazil, and you know Albert has talked about climate change. And then throughout this, uh, there's been a political vacuum where organizations like Daesh, Boko Haram, Taliban, and Al Qaeda found a space. And these are just we don't need a reminder. I mean, today is. Um, Remembrance Day, so I don't want to sort of go in details about the conflicts, but just to highlight, and there are challenges in terms of, I mean, although Albert has very kindly highlighted Washington foreign policy, I think it's also the West broadly, whichever way you define it and what that means. And we know um, the migrant crisis in Europe um, there have been challenges related to globalization with the economic redistribution, which have also led to climate change directly or indirectly with um, pollution and um, greenhouse effect and so on and so forth, and uh, the population flows. And Albert has already talked about uh, estimates of refugees, and I'm not going to go through them, but just to sort of emphasize that um, in a year between 2014 and 15, there was a massive increase and that increase has continued over the years. And again, Albert has already mentioned that uh, there's been a disproportionate burden largely carried on, um, borne by neighboring countries, many parts, but in Europe, particularly in Greece and Italy. And one of the big questions is that even when physical needs and physical health needs of migrants and asylum seekers are looked after, their mental health needs are often ignored. 
And we know that, uh, you know, the conflict, political turbulence, um, et cetera. And um, again, we've heard about uh, the figures from Venezuela, but it's 6.6 um, .6 million refugees come from Syria, 3.7 from Venezuela, 2.7 from Afghanistan, 2.3 from South Sudan, and 1 million from Myanmar. And in Europe, Asia, Turkey continues to be the country hosting the greatest number of refugees worldwide. So very quickly, I'm going to sort of highlight some of the challenges in terms of the mental health of migrants. And I'm not going to go through uh, the definitions, and but just to highlight uh, that populations are directly and indirectly uh, impacted upon, and that affects um, migration directly and indirectly. So the relationship between geopolitical determinants and social determinants is crucial. Because geopolitical de determinants in a way are supra-regional, they're transnational, but social determinants work at national, region, regional, and uh, local levels. But what's worth remembering is that geopolitical determinants impact upon social determinants. And why are migrants vulnerable? Partly because it's uh, you know stress of moving, pre-migration, migration, and post-migration, and factors to do with acculturation, et cetera. But I just want to say, why should we as health practitioners be interested in geopolitical determinants? Partly because health is political. Health is unequally distributed. Health determinants are dependent on political processes and because health is a critical basic human right. So we know demographics of migrants which will have different impact on different people, different kinds of occupations and three stages as, as I said, pre-migration, migration and uh, post-migration. In asylum seekers and refugees, you may not have time to prepare or uh, go through resources. Uh, so what does that do? Um, once you migrated, there are three kinds of response, immediate responses. There's cultural bereavement, there's culture shock and culture conflict. And cultural bereavement is about loss of social structures, cultural values and identity. And one of the things that we have written about is the idea of cultural capital, that cultural capital has three components from things like languages, dresses, dress, food, diet, jobs, qualifications, et cetera. And we carry that wherever we go. And that can produce these, uh, you, you may be losing a bit of the cultural capital and that may lead to that cultural loss and abandonment. And Eisenbrook's work, particularly with refugees, showed that individual's personality and whether they migrated alone plays a role in the genesis of cultural bereavement. And refugees quite often feel guilty because they have survived, abandoned their uh, loved ones or families. They have intrusive thoughts. And there is also a um, big challenge in imposing Western constructs on refugees and asylum seekers. And I think that's something if uh, we have time, we can further discuss. And culture shock affects various aspects of individuals functioning in the new country. And what that does is can cause anxiety, feelings of helplessness, feelings of impotence, uh, which confirms their feeling that not only the new culture is remarkably different, but also unwelcoming and alien, some of which may well be true. Um, and conflict can occur across generations, but also across new and old cultures and creates loads of uh, difficulties and problems. And it has both cognitive and affective dissonance. And the new country, its response to various dimensions need to be investigated. And quite often, um, regrettably, people use the term host country. Um, host country, means two things. One is that um, you are a guest and 
you know, when the host is fed up or host says, right, I'm, I don't need you anymore, you will go back. And the other dangerous interpretation of host country is parasites versus hosts. So I would sort of argue that we need to look at new country, new culture, and new ways. Uh, and acculturation is changing some of that cultural capital, changing language, learning rituals, uh, behaviors, attitudes, and it can also lead to one's own cultural contraction, cultural values become rather shrunk or expand as to how you come in um, contact with the new culture. And these are, you know, there's a considerable evidence in literature that migrants suffer high rates of all these conditions. And um, from um, it, Odegaard's study in 1934 to international pilot study of schizophrenia and determinants of severe mental disorders I have shown consistently that uh, rates among migrants are higher. But what we forget in Odegaard's work is that 50% of cases presented after 10 years or more. Uh, so it's not immediate stress of migration as to what happens to people after they have been living in a country for a time. And I'm, I'm going to sort of very quickly go through these just to highlight these ratios between African Caribbeans and UK natives. So high rates of 4.9 times, uh, 3.7, 5.3. Um, similarly, you know, 2.4, 8.4, 14.6. Uh, to consistently since 1960, we know that the rates of uh, schizophrenia among African Caribbeans in the UK have been uh, much, much greater than uh, the local population. And that evidence continues. Uh, and it continues not only in uh, Black Caribbean migrants, but now among uh, Black Africans, but also uh, in other countries, in the Netherlands, in Denmark, in the USA, in Sweden, um, in Israel. Um, and part of it has been described as being related to discrimination. And that's quite an interesting um, observation because it's not only the real discrimination, but perceived discrimination as to how I perceive people uh, behaving against me, and that can show um, high rates of uh, psychosis. Similarly, I mean, it's uh, rates of depressive neurosis in different ethnic groups in the UK. Uh, so Pakistani men are more likely than white men. Uh, Indian women are sort of slightly lower, but higher than Bangladeshi women in uh, presenting with a depression. Um, so there are differences. And again, when you look at treatments uh, compared to white uh, group in the UK, Indians, Pakistanis, Bangladeshis are given uh, far less antidepressants. Suicidal ideation in South Asian females is 2.4 times uh, that uh, compared with white women of the same age. Um, and this is quite an old study, but it's a very important uh, piece of work, which sort of showed that the rates of suicide are much higher in Asian women in the UK. Um, and what is really surprising is that virtually half were professionals, dentists and doctors, and quarter of them um, committed suicide by burning and a quarter by hanging. So rather violent means and similarly high rates of attempted suicide in um, uh, South Asian women, the kind of, um, you know, 37.5 compared to 23.3. And then South Asian women uh, compared to South Asian men is nearly three times uh, the rates. So what does that tell us? It tells us that uh, you know, there are challenges in terms of looking at going back to the point of geopolitical determinants, which are to do with collective violence that we all want to survive. So we want to run away. 
political unrest, food insecurity, colonization, um, climate change, and environmental um, degradation, and local rates of mental illness and healthcare utilization in migrant populations, we believe are geopolitically determined. And world is interconnected, whether we like it or not. And particularly the impact of globalization in a way has been studied at an economic level, but not at a health level. Uh, people face disasters, be they man-made or natural, ongoing regional conflicts. And the reason we have different rates of infection as in the pandemic and different mortalities are largely to do with each country's policies. And as we've already heard that, you know, 100 million uh, vaccines were offered and X, X number are still sitting there somewhere uh, waiting for an expiry date. But what the point that I really want to highlight is that um, there are going to be international transnational factors that we need to be aware of, which are to do with human movement and interaction, which require uh, clear interlinked uh, approaches. And these geopolitical factors influence people's lives uh, with national boundaries, continental geographies, proximity and distance from neighbors, et cetera. And these should be seen as a system of relationships among assets and processes which link communities at higher levels of organization. And social determinants focus pretty well on community and individual health. And emerging from uh, the Black Report and uh, earlier work on mortality inequalities and Marmot Commission, as I said, it's on interrelations between social factors and individuals, but geopolitical determinants are attributed to an insufficient capturing of the complexities of policy making, uh, including policy making across country contexts. And again, in the UK, we have more than one different healthcare system, although it's all national health service, but it'll be really interesting to compare uh, between Scotland and England and Wales and Northern Ireland as to what uh, those factors are. And as Albert highlighted, the geopolitical determinants such as foreign aid and policy responses to disaster uh, can influence the distribution. And in, after the 2004 Asian tsunami, I was invited by the WHO Southeast Asia Regional Office to visit uh, various countries which had been affected by uh, the same tsunami, but the countrywide responses were so different and so shocking uh, that um, in spite of huge amounts of foreign aid, uh, the responses varied, uh, mortality, some of it attributed to tsunami, but some of it attributed to post-tsunami healthcare or lack thereof. So I think one of the challenges for all of us is to be advocates go beyond uh, the social determinants and link up geopolitical and social determinants together to try and understand what the impact of policies, let's take European Union for example, what's the policy of the union as a whole? Within that, there are countrywide health policies within which, for example, there would be regional differences. So what does that mean in terms of mental health and how do we understand those geopolitical processes and uh, issues related to um, that. So we need to locate the social determinants within the context of complex geopolitical systems of interrelated uh, country contexts. And uh, social determinants in one country may well differ from social determinants in another. So that's something that we need to be very flexible about. And what's really interesting is in this uh, study by Gupta et al. from America, uh, they looked at that um, once America reduced 
um, state aid between 2009 and 2016, threat levels against America uh, went up. So a decline in foreign aid affected uh, threat levels. So there's quite clear uh, impact on global security. So we need to be looking at in-depth understanding of the geographic and political context within which policy decisions are made, whether they're on individual or collective lines. And we, all of last week, we've been hearing about um, climate change and, and its impact. And one of the big challenges for all of us is to persuade the institutions we work in to try and change and go down to uh, reduce our consumption and try and reduce that. So political conflicts in countries coupled with drought or famine or floods as a result of uh, climate change contribute to international and domestic migration and displacement. Absolutely no doubt about it. So what we need to be thinking about, what are the key geopolitical determinants and what are the challenges uh, we know that uh, you know, global heating would produce further inequalities in wealth, health. And again, we heard earlier about the figures of uh, billionaires and um, how much money is needed to vaccinate uh, the rest of the world. So we need geopolitical solutions in delivery of mental health systems, policymakers, and health professionals need to work together to look at uh, climate altering pollutants, climate and farming related suicide, water security, water scarcity, famine and uh, floods. And therefore, my urging to you is that uh, psychiatry needs to model itself in the context of geopsychiatry influences. Um, Multidimensional global challenges need to be addressed. And within that, I think there are things that I've said uh, before, and I will say it again, that we need to be advocates. We need to work with policymakers. We need to have evidence. And we heard about failed states and um, giving aid, bearing in mind the vulnerability. But geopolitical factors can also lead to discrimination because we all have stereotypes. So we need to challenge those. And variation in rates of mental illnesses across different groups, different countries, different societies need to be looked at in the broader geopolitical uh, context and uh, potential explanations. And um, I would like to, to and by thanking Albert for taking the lead and uh, for Laura um, and her team at Royal Society of Public Health to giving us this opportunity. And I very much hope that uh, this would be first of many webinars so that as we have audience from around the world today, we can carry on uh, discussing, debating and learning from each other as to what we need to do in order to bring about a sustained and sustainable change. Thank you very much. Thank you um, very, very much, Dinesh. I mean, such stark figures in, in both of your presentations there and such, um, such obvious inequity across the world. And I think, you know, one of the things that we need to really think about in health is thinking bigger than our own front door, if you like. So thinking bigger than our own areas of work and our own geographies and uh, borders and boundaries are man-made. So our world is is collective and we're all part of the same the same world. We do have a huge amount of questions and, and I'm going to apologise in advance to the audience. We are not going to get through all of the questions um, yes, you will. All the presentations and the webinar will be made available afterwards. But one of the biggest questions that we've had or the question that's come up more than any other, um, and you, you have touched on it in your presentations, but is the link between geopolitical determinants and the, the, the more known social determinants. Um, we have sort of covered it, but is there anything else that you feel 
how, how do how do they align for you those two different approaches how can we use them to work together and to lead to improvements when we factor in both social and geopolitical um albert do you want to go first and then dinesh if you want to come in yeah thank, thank you for that and thank you dinesh for that wonderful um roller coaster ride through now i don't see it very much as an, an alignment i see it much more as more connected into the heart of you know of, of health and our existence and i think it will take a few um, webinars to to explore this further covid has shown has exposed the fragility in the sense that um we are not an island our, on our own and we're not a country on our own or any other country that we interdependent on each other how the virus got here, how it got elsewhere, how the vaccines are manufactured, how it's administered, whatever. That is geopolitics, how it's, how it's bought, how it's made available. And that is just a good example of how the geopolitics is needed so as to deliver an effective COVID response strategy. And we need, we need the same game for, for climate change. And my, 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 my urge is let's begin to you know, widen our thinking and our thoughts professionally, clinically, that some of these factors that affect our lives are much more than what we present as a symptom. In psychiatry, we are taught about etiology and looking for causation. We do need to think seriously of how we incorporate it into our training and how we move forward. Didn't you have some thoughts in terms of how you can explain it in, in relation to a diagram or something like that? I think, uh, I mean, one, one of the things that we have consistently failed is to learn from each other. Uh, we know what the you know, social determinants are in this country and the commission set up by WHO led by Michael Marmot covered the world. But the challenges are about poverty can be relative poverty. And, but it also is to do with food scarcity, it's to do with unemployment, it's to do with poor housing and overcrowding and um, lack of access to green spaces, etc. So part of the challenge really is that the in, we need to explore that interconnectedness that Albert was talking about between geopolitical determinants and social determinants because if you change things at a geopolitical level, social determinants may or may not change depending on the national policies. So we need to come at it from both sides to make sure that when, you know, an epidemic occurs, be it Zika, Ebola, or, you know, situation we are in, viruses know no borders. Uh, so there are things that we need to do together. We need to learn from each other and things that we have to do for ourselves. And it is everyone's responsibility to try and um, shout for um, to the policymakers and say, you know, you need to change this. And, and I was going to ask about that. So there's just been a, a couple of comments in the chat about these disparities aren't new, um, and how how do we get policymakers and political leaders to take notice of the geopolitical determinants and and ensure that the policy that we are all working to is policy that will keep as many people safe and reduce those inequities? Uh, that's a big question. But what what kind of thing can people in this virtual room do to get their political leaders to take more note of these issues? Well, Albert, Albert has worked in the Department of Health, so he can probably say more about that. But I think it is um, most politicians go into politics to change things, generally for the better. So the challenge really is to make them aware of what their legacy is going to be. What do they want to be remembered for? And that would be you know, one way and second would be to giving, creating, noting, sharing evidence 
as you know, Michael Marmot has done to say that, look, you know, if, if you live in these areas, you're likely to live longer. If you, you know, move into other geographical areas, your longevity drops. And it's taken a long time. And, you know, politicians are not talking about, um, you know, Marmot's work and taking it seriously. So I think it, it's a united front, both transnationally and uh, nationally. Albert, do you want to sort of uh, talk about your experience? Yeah, I mean, my, my view is that we need a multi-dimensional approach to tackling these issues from the community individual level all the way up to the political sort of UN level. I think COVID restricted, I mean, from a personal point of view, it was an opportunity for me to run this seminar for UK MPs and Houses of Parliament. But because of COVID, we haven't been able to do that. So that is planned to have an event in Parliament to invite those from the House of Lords to explain this. Because there's one thing politicians want to hear, you know, can they do something better? And that, can they be, as you said, can they really be remembered for something? And all politicians want that. I work with the Blair government and the politicians were quite, were quite keen. How do I want to be remembered for in terms of foreign policy, health or, 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 or whatever? So if you can help them along with that, because, you know, we are a big fund along with America. But the other thing as well, we have to start this movement and move forward and get everyone to understand it, to agree it and discuss it and disagree with it. But I have a little caution because I think this is an example. The, United, the WHO published the Mental Health Atlas two weeks ago. And it was a series of targets they had set in 2013, I think. And only one of those targets were met, and that was around suicide, a reduction of. A lot of targets failed. So what they have done is extended that, those targets that was due for 2020 to 2030, and just add a few more bits inside. I do believe, I put it to you, that is with all the geopolitical changes, you really cannot reformulate the old customs and say that is what we're gonna deliver in 2030. And I would like to see all the global initiatives, Health for All, the SDGs, uh, 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 and, and, and you know, the, the mental health, the WHO mental health um, ob objectives Atlas. and everything, Atlas, to be revisited, to incorporate today's challenges. You cannot use, you know, what we were faced with 10, 15 years ago and says, oh, those targets are fit, including the SDGs. There are 68 goals. There's a lot of goals, mm -hmm. yes? And when you're struggling to feed your family or heat your home, those 68 goals become insignificant. It thinks has to be meaningful and people must feel that your vocabulary reflects the way they're feeling. So I urge the United Nations, WHO, governments, you know, to think about revisiting these formulas. Yes, you know, America talks about build back better. But for many countries, they have never had a better. Yeah. Palestine never had a better. There are many generations growing up the world ever. So we need to build forward for a better society, a better global world. And we will not achieve that until we look at the global determinants. I just want to finish by saying, there's always a danger that focuses on attention on social determinants of health or any of the other determinants only serves to divert attention from the more difficult transnational and humanitarian problems we face with today that demands political, environmental and economic solutions. These things like social determinants or the strategic development goal may collude with those who benefit from the status quo and neutralize political challenges by reframing problem as aspects of system that requiring some sort of change. You know. 3.5 billion people today live in undemocratic societies. Let's think of that. So, in order... use... sorry, go on, Albert. And we cannot use models that's developed in the northern world or tested in the northern world and believe that will work in the global south. And that was a feature of some of the questions that was emerging from what you sent us in rank, you know, decolonization, things like that. But again, Dinesh, it has given us some thoughts to develop some more these webinars or however you want to plan it laura yeah absolutely so our point is we have to tackle the, the big issues the issues that can make the biggest impact through geopolitical um rather than focus uh, as well as the the, the issues that are yes. more 
individual and, and environmental, but those big issues, if we don't tackle those, then we're yeah. 10, 15, 20 years. Um, I am really conscious of time and, and apologies to people, we haven't got to all of the questions. Um, as Albert just said, we do want to run some more of these because there's been some really, really good interest. So I would ask um, if you would like to join a second event or a conference or a, whatever it might be, if you have any thoughts about geopolitical determinants of health, if you could email them over to me at engagement.org.uk. So engagement at rsph.org.uk. Um, we will have a look at what else we can do. What else? I think this is a, a fantastic um, opportunity to hear. Um, thank you, Albert and Dinesh, so, so, so much for your time with this. I know virtual um, isn't always straightforward. I will put the email. Sorry, I'm trying to, I'm trying to read the comments so I don't miss things at the same time. Um, <laughs> Just we, we do have another webinar on the 9th of December, um, actually with Michael Marmot. It's not going to be specifically around social determinants, but it's going to be a Q&A with Michael Marmot. So if anybody would like to ask him a particular question, please do sign up for that webinar. Uh, you can find details on our website. And if you are an RSPH member and you want to offer to do anything or you aren't an RSPH member, but you want to be, then again, email me, um, let me pop the email address in the chat function now. Um, and just, yeah, really huge thank you to both of you for taking your time. Really huge thank you to everybody for joining today. Um, I hope that you have all uh, enjoyed it and you've all got something from it. Um, and really hope to see you all again very, very soon. And um, try and do your bit, as Albert and Dinesh has told us, as to how we can help make the world a better place and make it more equitable for everybody. Thank you very much, everyone. We'll thank, sign up. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for organising this. My pleasure. Take care, everyone. Take care. Take care. Stay safe. Bye.